We're continuing in our uh, preaching through the book of Judges, and we're going to look, believe it or not, as we look at the depravity of mankind that we're going to discover in the passage we see today, even in the midst of that, we are going to discover God's grace. Now, it is always a challenge to raise children. Would anybody agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> And some of you, your, your, your kids are growing up and they're having kids, and you still see that it's always a struggle to raise children, right? There's, there's something about children where they come pre-wired to defy their parents. Did you ever notice that? How many of you had to train your child to say no? All right. How many of you had to train your child to, to disobey you, right? You know? How many of you had that conversation with your spouse? You know, sweetheart, I just don't understand. Something's wrong with our child. Like, they never say no to us, and, and, and they never disobey us. They just, I don't get it, right? Anybody ever had that problem? No, right? I can remember years ago, my, my, my wife asked Bethany to clean her room, and she, she looked at my wife and said, no, thank you, Mommy. No. Now, she was very sweet in her defiance. She was very nice in the way that she didn't want to have anything to do with what she was being asked to do, but she was still defiant. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. And I've thought of that over the years. You know, her, her response, well, no, thank you, Mommy. And I think, how many times does the Lord tell us in his word what to do? And we say, oh, no, thanks. No, thanks, Father. I, I, I'm really not interested in doing that. You know, we, we can be... Nice in our defiance as well, I imagine. And my daughter's act of defiance might have been a very minor thing, but it still displays a character of the heart that even in an early age is one of rebellion. We are born with that, that heart, that inclination that wants to go against God's law. There's something in us. We're wired that way. And I don't care who you look at, you can find the most godly person that you can think of, right? Maybe go ahead and do that for a moment. Think of the most holy person. I know you're not thinking of me, so good. But think of the most holy person you can think of, right? That person, I can guarantee you, came pre-wired with defiance towards God. Because we all did. We all have that same inclination. We would, left to ourselves, we would rebel against God every single day. It's the way we're wired. Now, let's go back to the story of my daughter because I'm hoping she'll watch us later and, and realize that she's been part of one of her dad's sermons yet again. <clears throat> she showed her little act of rebellion as a child, and we loved her. And if she had grown up and committed heinous crimes and felonies, we would have surely been disappointed, but we would have loved her, right? We love our kids no matter what they struggle with, no matter where they go, no matter what they do, no matter what things they're involved in. We love them because they're our kids, right? And we should. Well, as we dive into this account of the people of Israel, we're going to find God's children are defiant children, and it's going to be instructive for us to see how God deals with defiant children. Okay? So that's where we're going. Judges 2, 16 through 23 is our text this morning. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges. For they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the ways of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now, in this passage, we certainly can see defiance in Israel. We can see that 
even when they were delivered, they went not only back to their level of wickedness and depravity, they actually ex exceeded it. But there's something else going on here, and I want you to see God's grace involved in the whole situation. We see grace initiated by God for the purpose of salvation that demands a response. This account in Judges sets the stage for the whole book. In fact, as you look at this, this cycle of God's grace, gracious deliverance, followed by Israel going right back to their sinful ways, God delivers back to their sinful ways, God delivers. This cycle just keeps on going on and on. And this is really, uh, this passage of the book of Judges is setting you up for the whole rest of the book. So as you go through the rest of the book of Judges, you see this cycle repeated again and again. And we discover who these different judges are, and we see their lives, and we see the way that the people react. So we'll see this cycle of depravity. And uh, again, it will emphasize just how much the people of Israel rebelled against the covenant that they had made with God. And yet, even in the midst of this book, we see something amazing about our God. We see that he is a gracious God. One of the things that we need to always do when we look at any passage of Scripture is we look at it with an understanding of all of what God's character is, right? So if you see God acting in wrath. He's also gracious. He's also merciful. He's also loving. He's all, he is those things always. Whatever character traits that God has, he doesn't sometimes have them and then throw them aside. God is eternally gracious. He is eternally loving. He is eternally just. He is eternally holy. He is eternally all of those things. All of the things that God is, he always is. In theological terms, we would call that the immutability of God. God does not change. And by the way, that's a good thing. That's a good, we don't have a God who we wonder if his salvation, if he meant it when he offered it before, or is he going to yank it away from us? When God forgives our sins, does he decide tomorrow, I'm not going to forgive your sins, right? We count upon God's faithfulness. We count upon the fact that his character and his nature is unchanging. We sang it this morning, great is thy faithfulness. He, we know him to be faithful because he is consistently always who he is. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Amazing how much good theology is right there in that hymn we sang today. Let's take a look at Psalm 103. Again, get an understanding from this other portion of Scripture about the character and nature of God as you view the, this other passage in Judges that talks about his judgment and how he deals with his people. Psalm 103, 8 through 14, what do we find out about the Lord? The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. What a beautiful picture of the character and the nature of God. And so when we see, well, God brought wrath upon this people or that people, understand that he also is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger. And so if he's poured out his wrath... Prior to that, we can discover that he's actually been merciful and patient, but he's also just, and so he can't let sin be unpunished. One thing we know about God's character is that he does not change, and it says here that he is gracious and compassionate to his children. So how do we see that grace demonstrated then in the book of Judges, and in particular in our passages in Judges 2? Let's look at two verses here in this passage. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand 
of their enemies all the days of that judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. In this cycle of depravity of the people of Israel, notice who takes the initiative to bring them deliverance. It says, for the Lord raised up judges. It doesn't even say they cried out. It says, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. It wasn't that the people of Israel were crying out for help that got God's attention. It was God noticing their terrible situation and showing compassion. What's the point? God took the initiative. God saw their need. God saw their situation. God brought deliverance. God brought salvation. And guess what, friends? How does that work for us? He sees our sinful condition. He sees our desperate need. And he takes action. God initiates that whole relationship. Now, it's interesting that the people that God is showing compassion to, the people that God is hearing, they're groaning and they're crying out for help. It's not the kind of people you'd look at and say, well, they really are deserving for God, for God to help them, right? I mean, verse 19 is really, really helpful for us to see just how wicked they were. Whenever the judge died, they turned back, were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They didn't drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. No, they just added to them. Reminds me of Romans 1, talks about the the, the wrath of God that is coming upon mankind. One of the ways that man is described is they invent ways of doing evil. (laughs) Some people are really creative sinners. These people never dropped any of their evil practice. Rather, they just become more corrupt. These are the same people who were led by God out of slavery in Egypt. God gives them a promised land, and they forget them as soon as they could. And I could say, why in the world would God love people who are so rebellious? But I'd have to ask the question, why also would God love me? Because I see in, in, in my heart of hearts the same heart of rebellion. When I look in the mirror, I see someone just as prone to wickedness as anybody else. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we cleaned ourselves up and did enough good works and gave enough money to this organization and did that and did that beneficial thing to somebody and we did all this stuff. No, 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 no. While we were still sinners, while we are in the midst of our greatest rebellion, God says, I'm sending my son to die for those people and offer salvation. The love that we receive, we do not deserve. And so no one has a right to be proud of his standing as a Christian because none of us deserved it. None of you were good enough to receive salvation, nor was I, nor is anybody. We don't deserve it. Ah, but we'd be such fools to reject it, wouldn't we? Notice that it is God who sees us in our distress. He heard your groaning, and he had pity, and he offered his mercy. You're not saved, friend, because you're good. You're saved because you're wicked and needed a Savior. That's why you're saved. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. How does Paul describe us before salvation, us before Christ? Oh, quite simply, we're followers of Satan. (laughs) Pardon? What? (laughs) Go share that with your non-believing friends. Hey, did you know you're a follower of Satan? What? (laughs) But that's what what Paul's saying here. He's saying every, every single one of us either were or are in slavery to Satan himself. And Satan is a terrible master. He offers things that he doesn't deliver on. He offers freedom while he keeps you in chains. So many people, they think, well, I wouldn't want to be a Christian. I couldn't have any fun. 
They just haven't come to Troy Baptist. We have fun. We even eat good. Come on now. Fair food, I'll take a Baptist potluck any day of the week. Just saying. Cheaper too. Wednesday, 12 o'clock. Shameless plug. Satan's not a good master, and, and many of us were groaning in the oppression of the enemy, and God heard our cry. Just as with the people of Israel, so it is with us. God takes the initiative. God reaches out and offers salvation. And in fact, we see that it is God's grace that is for our salvation. Let's go ahead and look at the same verses we looked at before, verse 16 and 18. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. And then verse 18, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. This, this word save, it's talking about our, our salvation. Sometimes we'll say, I'm saved. And, and, and the non-believing person you're talking to says, what, what does that mean? Saved from what? First and foremost, you're saved from the wrath of God, Right? Because in your sinful condition, in your unholy stance with a holy God, you are deserving of his wrath. And so we need to be saved ultimately from the wrath of God, which we rightly deserve. God delivers us from our sinful condition. The word, this word save implies this idea of rescuing somebody. Now, in the context of the people of Israel, they needed to be rescued from the hands of their oppressors. And depending on which judge we're reading about, it might have been the Midianites or the Philistines or another Canaanite uh, people that was oppressing them. They're in slavery. They're in bondage. And so God's grace comes to them specifically for their rescue. But friends, his grace is also for our rescue. Let's go back to Ephesians again because it's very fun. Verses 4 through 9 from Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to some of this language. This is just rich, powerful language from the Apostle Paul. Hear how he describes God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast." By grace, we have been saved. We have been delivered from our sinful condition. We have been delivered from our destiny of eternal judgment. Both the people of Israel and the people of today need salvation. We need to be rescued from our trespasses or sins. And one of the biggest tragedies today is that we don't seem to see our own need of salvation. So many people today look at their own works, they look at their own efforts, and they say, I'm pretty darn good. God's going to have to let me into heaven. I mean, after all, look at all the stuff I've done. Well, wait a minute. Paul says it's not a result of work. So it really doesn't matter how nice your works look, does it? And why? So that no one may boast. If you get into heaven because of what you do, then who gets the credit? You do. But Christ didn't die so that you could get the credit, did he? Christ did the work. Christ gets the honor. Christ gets the glory. And Christ is the one who provides the salvation, not us. There are going to be many people not in heaven and maybe shocked because they thought they did so many good things. And God says in his word, the only thing that you're to do is to receive my free gift. But instead of simply receiving it humbly, you determined I'll be good enough on my own. I don't need your gift, thank you so much. I'm good just the way I am. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not about works. It is by grace we have been saved. Notice in that passage, just in, in verses 4 through 9, 
Paul repeats that phrase, by grace, that we, it's by grace we have been saved twice. Anytime the Bible repeats stuff, it isn't because God forgot to say it before. <laughs> He's emphasizing it so we get the point. It's by grace we've been saved. It was by grace that the people of Israel found salvation from their oppressors, and it is by grace that you will find salvation from your sin. Now, we can look at the book of Judges. We can see people worshiping idols, even sacrificing their children in the fire. It is grotesque. It is horrifying to even think of. And it's so easy to look at them, and we can see how wicked they are and how much they need help. We can look at family members and say, oh, they're wicked. (laughs) Right? We go to family reunions, and we can say, oh, my goodness. The Lord needs to bring a lot of salvation here, right? There's a lot of sinners here. But we fail to see our own need. We ought, to be, we ought to be the most humble people on earth. We ought to daily remind ourselves, I am nothing but a sinner saved by the grace of God. Without His grace, I am eternally doomed. <laughs> if our works could save us, we'd already be saved. And more significantly, if our works could save us, then Christ would not have come to save us. Can you imagine what a horrible tragedy it would have been if Christ was crucified? And the, the very Son of God tortured and crucified in such horrendous, awful way, if somehow it was unnecessary? If we could be good enough and save ourselves, then that makes the crucifixion not a good story, not an inspiring thing, but actually an act of horrendous Hatred by God the Father towards His own Son. If, if, the, if the Son dies for no reason, and, and didn't Jesus say, Lord, if there be any other way that this cup should, should pass from me, but nevertheless not my will be done. He said that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's saying, if there's any other way we can do this, <laughs> nope. It was God's plan. It was the only way that salvation could be purchased for us. We're not good enough. I hope that doesn't upset you, um, but that is reality. And that's, that's, the, that's the first step towards being saved is recognizing that we need salvation and that our own works are not good enough. Think of that one maybe who's, who's crying out from deep water and they're, they're drowning and they cry out, save me, I'm drowning. Well, that perspective changes if we found out that that person claiming to be drowning knows how to swim, right? We say, well, wait a minute, they could just swim to shore. They don't need to be saved, they just need to swim. But you see, we're drowning in sin, and we need to be rescued, and we can't swim. And we're in deep water. And trying to be saved by your works would be like that drowning person flailing their arms and trying to work their way to rescue. They're just going to tire themselves out on on their way to their own death. God's grace is given to his children, the people of Israel, to save them. And his grace has been given to us to save us because we desperately need a Savior. God's grace initiated by Him for our salvation. And that grace demands a response. The people of Israel were offered God's grace. He took the initiative. He saved them from their oppressors. And God wanted a right response from them. He wanted obedience. What did He get? Well, verses 20 to 23 tells us what He got. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the ways of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. God's offer of grace was not met with thanksgiving. It was not met with obedience, but rather it was met with even more sin, more disobedience, and even greater rebellion. How tragic. It isn't that they couldn't see God's loving hand. God sent judges to save them. But they rebelled against the knowledge that they did have and his gifts of grace. 
you would do well to turn to Romans 1 later on today. Do a study of Romans 1 and, 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 and think about what God wants mankind to respond to him. Part of the reason that God's wrath comes upon mankind, Paul says in Romans 1, although they knew God and saw, the, saw all of the things that he created, they, ne they neither gave him glory or th they, ne they did not acknowledge him or give him thanks. God wants for us to show him gratitude. And we display that gratitude in our obedience. Did God get that response? No, not at all. But God's grace always requires a response. God does his part, and we need to respond properly to the grace that's been offered to us. It is a lie of the enemy to believe that God's ways are not for our good. God offers grace. He wants us to respond and receive his gift of salvation. And I think the most tragic thing is there are people who have heard the story again and again and again. They've sat on a church pew. They've talked to some godly person. They've heard the message of the gospel. And they say, that's a really nice story. And they go home and, and, and never respond. And just like God left the people of Israel, he left those other nations to continue to harass them. If you want to reject God's offer of grace, you can continue to live in the same bondage that you're in. He'll let you live there. It is amazing how the world around us reacts to God's offer of grace as if it would mean the death of anything good in our lives. Interesting story. In 1981, a Minnesota radio station reported a story about a stolen car in California. Police were staging an intense search for the vehicle and the driver, even to the point of placing announcements on local radio stations to contact the thief. On the front seat of the stolen car sat a box of crackers that, unknown to the thief, were laced with poison. The car owner had intended to use the crackers as rat bait. Now the police and the owner of the VW Bug were more interested in apprehending the thief to save his life than to recover the car. So often when we run from God, we feel it's to escape his punishment, but what we're actually doing is eluding his rescue. He's offering us grace, and we run. What are we doing? I love the story we find in the Gospels where Jesus had preached some pretty harsh words, and, and, and people were leaving in droves. It was when Jesus said, my... My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And people in droves begin leaving, right? And, and Jesus looks to his disciples, and he says, are you going to leave too? And what does Peter say? Where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Why would we run from God's grace? Why would we run from an offer of salvation that is so great? God's grace demands a response. The proper response is, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I place my faith in you. This Old Testament book of Judges teaches us quite a bit about the character and the nature of God and also the character and nature of mankind. God looks at us and offers grace. Grace is initiated by God. He sees us in our groaning and offers grace. And that grace is offered to rescue us from that sin. It is for our salvation. And friends, God offers his grace. If you're hearing this, you're hearing an offer of grace. What a foolish thing it would be to hear an offer of grace and not respond with gratitude, with repentance, with faith, with obedience. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how we see, even in, a, in an Old Testament story of your people in Israel, all the way through your word we see this demonstration of your character, and it is your character and your nature to show compassion and grace to sinners. Lord, I pray that anyone who would hear this message 
either right here in this room or, or watching it on a video or whatever, Lord, if, if there's anybody who hears this message and needs to be forgiven of their sin and have right relationship with you, Lord, that they would receive that offer of grace, recognizing it is by grace we have been saved through faith, and this not our own doing. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Lord, I pray that we would have that right response of repentance and faith in you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.